Welcome to the department's Warren Seminar Series. My name is Joel Labus, department head for civil, environmental, and geoengineering. It is indeed my privilege to introduce today's speaker, uh, our colleague, Professor Bill Arnold. Uh, Bill received his bachelor's and master's degrees in chemical engineering from MIT and Yale. He then went to Johns Hopkins, where he earned his PhD in environmental engineering. Soon after, he joined, immediately after he joined. Um, like five days. Our, five days? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he joined our department, um, and that was in 1999. He was promoted to associate professor in 2005 and to professor in 2010. Uh, Bill was awarded the Joseph T. and Rose S. Ling Professorship in January of 2010, and that was recently renewed. He was a visiting researcher at Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology in 2006 and 7, and at the Wood Hole Oceania Oceanographic Institute in 2013 and 14. Work that has uh, brought Bill particular notoriety is his decade-long decade study of triclosan, an antibacterial compound used in a vi wide variety of household products, such as liquid hand soap. Uh, the findings from Bill's research, uh, in fact, led to the Minnesota House and Senate uh, passing a bill in 2014, which Governor Dayton signed, where uh, triclosan is now banned in Minnesota. In 2011, Bill received the College of Science and Engineering George W. Taylor Award for Distinguished Research. And in 2012, he received the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors Award from his peers in environmental in, from the environmental engineering community. And the award recognizes an environmental engineering or science professor who has advanced the field through recognized research leadership and pioneering efforts in new and innovative research areas. So with that, please join me in welcoming our colleague, Bill Arnold. Thanks, Joe. And I'm not gonna talk about the triclosan work today. I'm gonna to talk about uh, our work in the prairie potholes of North Dakota. And so this is our, our field site. We do seasonal sampling out there. And so you can see there's a, a change here and we'll see those differences a couple of different times. Uh, just to be clear, it's not these potholes. <laughs> Mihai was very excited when he saw the talk at first. But. So I'm, I'm going to talk uh, first about why we're interested in, in what happens to pesticides and the like in these prairie potholes in North Dakota. Uh, I'm going to look at the photochemistry of the pesticides that we studied and then trying to predict that photochemistry uh, computationally. And then that got us interested in, in the composition of some of the organic matter and the sediments in the system. And so I'll look at some of that characterization as well. So the potholes were formed throughout uh, the, this region in North Central America when the glaciers retreated 16,000 years ago. And they basically left behind these depressions in the landscape. And they're hydrologically connected through groundwater. And so uh, there's no rivers through this system, but you have uh, up, up gradient areas where the rainfall uh, is collected goes through the groundwater and is altered by the geochemistry as it goes from the upgradient sites to the downgradient sites. So this region covers a, a large portion of uh, the northern plains here. The energy production area of North Dakota is over here, but the western, uh, sorry, the eastern part has prey potholes and we've been uh, focusing our efforts here, but it's also relevant to Minnesota and Iowa. But these systems aren't the same as they were 16,000 years ago, obviously, uh, largely due to agricultural activity. And so if you've got all these wetlands in your farmland, crops don't grow in them. And so there's been lots of emphasis on trying to drain them. And so this is just changes uh, from 1980 to 2007 in draining various uh, pothole regions in Minnesota. And of course, you're not supposed to drain wetlands anymore. Right? You're supposed to restore them. But if you put things back, put new wetlands, they're not the same as the old wetlands. And so Paul Cable dug up this nice device here trying to dig out your prairie potholes and try and level your land. And if, once you start working out there, you get good at spotting where a farmer has tried to do this because you might be able to fill in it with dirt, but that doesn't mean the water still doesn't flow there. And so you see these areas in the fields where the crops just don't grow. 
and it's because it's too wet and the, the hydrology still keeps the crops from growing even though you filled them in with, with dirt. So throughout uh, this agricultural region, there's you know, pesticide use and so all pesticide use in the U.S. has you know, increased for a long time and it's kind of steadied out, but we're talking millions of pounds of agricultural chemicals that are used per year. And they're spread onto crops and then they're going to make their way into these uh, water systems. And of course, our yellow outline is the prairie pothole region. And we've altered this landscape, so this was the, the prairies, and now it's largely agriculture. And that means that you have these potholes now embedded in agricultural fields. And so it's very likely that they are going to be impacted by pesticides. So you know, here's one where they've tried to fill it in and grow crops and it doesn't look so good. Um, and not only are they going to be impacted by pesticides, this is important for a couple different reasons. One, the pesticides shouldn't be there and they're toxic chemicals. Two, this is duck breeding habitat. And we've been sampling out here in June and they're just birds everywhere. And so if you're accumulating pesticides where the birds are, there's potential for toxic effects there and impacts on the bird populations. So how do the pesticides get into these uh, wetlands? Well, they're applied to the farmland and they can run off during the rainstorm. If you've got any kind of tile drains, they can be Pump, uh, go through the groundwater flow into the system. Uh, and then there's vapor drift when they're applied and they wind up being atmospherically deposited. And so we were interested at first in looking at what happened in the sediments, because uh, a lot of them will absorb the particles and then float down to the sediments. And we wanted to see if any degradation occurred in these systems or whether they were accumulating in the, in the region. So the chemistry of these systems is, is really interesting. So it turns out that the underlying geochemistry, there's pyrite in the glacial till. And so depending on where you are in the, the gradient, if you're at the up gradient sites where the water will essentially have the chemistry of rainwater, but if you go to the down gradient sites after the, wet, the water has flowed through the groundwater a, a few times, you get tremendously high levels of sulfate, you know, close to what you have in the ocean. And so then you get uh, sulfate reduction in the sediments where you get the sulfate reduced to hydrogen sulfide. And so what we started out looking at was what's happening to these pesticides in the sediments. And when you go into these wetlands, what we'll got, they're only a couple of meters deep, and you put on weighted boots and step in them, and the hydrogen sulfide just bubbles out and you can smell it. So the first time we went out there, we took respirators with us because we were probably above levels that we should really be exposed to. Then all the USGS guys just wandered through there willy-nilly, and so we figured it's probably not that big of a concern. In doing this part of this work, though, we also discovered that the dissolved organic matter in the waters was very high. And so dissolved organic matter is what gives the water its nice brown color. And most of these wetlands, you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 to 100 milligrams per liter of carbon. In typical Mississippi River water, you know, 5, 10 milligrams per liter. So these are, are very stained. And so that got us interested in the photochemistry because as the organic matter absorbs sunlight, it creates all sorts of reactive species, including uh, the excited state of oxygen, which is singlet oxygen, hydroxyl radicals, carbonate radicals, and then the organic matter itself can get photo excited. And all of those can react with the pesticides. So this was a multi-year study that we actually were still ongoing. Uh, so we did sampling North Dakota. We're looking at the sediments in the surface waters. And I'm going to focus uh, down here, by and large, on the surface water chemistry, the pesticide photolysis, and the characterization of, of the organic matter. Uh, we've published uh, various papers on the poor, what happens in the pore waters as well. So our site is in uh, Jamestown, North Dakota. So if you leave for Minneapolis at lunchtime, you're there by dinner time, and there aren't that many places to eat in Jamestown, North Dakota. Uh, so this is the Cottonwood Lake study area. It's actually owned by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and managed by the USGS, uh, basically for research purposes. But the reason U.S. Fish and Wildlife owns it is it's uh, designated duck breeding habitat. So it's set aside that so uh, birds can breed there, and so. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking at uh, P1 and P8. These are permanent wetlands. Uh, I think this is P7. I have some data from there as well. And then one of these out over here is, is T9, which means it's temporary. So it's there in the wet seasons in the spring and it dries out in the summer and the fall. So we get to go out to North Dakota, get to spend a couple of days out on this nice wetland. Uh, we'll go out with sediment coring equipment. That's Kate from Ohio State out on the, the boat with me there. And we would bring these sediment cores back. This is my collaborator, Yo Chin, at Ohio State. And we would uh, squeeze out the, the pore waters. We'd also go out there and take surface water samples. 
You get these nice, this isn't yellow, isn't actually coming from the table, it's actually coming from the staining of the water. We actually, the first sampling trip was actually in January of 2010, which we learned later to be a mistake. <laughs> um, so this is what the vehicle you need to get out to the site in, in January. Uh, this is us trying to drill holes through the ice. That's the Argo. So Yo had actually just gotten back from a, a trip to Antarctica to do sampling. And it was, uh, it was 32 in Antarctica and it was minus one in North Dakota. And so he wanted to go back to Antarctica after we had done this. That's me trying to stay warm. And you know, you got to get your samples out of the, the holes instead of out thing. And this, this is Dave from the USGS and he's the North Dakota guy. It's minus one. He doesn't even bother with gloves. <laughs> so this is a, a piece of uh, Tong Zung's thesis looking at the pesticide photolysis in these surface waters. So I have to thank Tung for, for doing all this work and I don't think he slept much while he did it. Uh, he's about to start as a faculty member at Syracuse in, in January. And this was funded by NSF. So what we're looking at here is the organic matter getting shined on by sunlight, creating these reactive intermediates, which we call photically produced reactive intermediates or PPRIs. And then these reactive intermediates destroy the pesticide. The light, the organic matter can also screen the sunlight and either and inhibit any direct absorbance by the pesticide which leads to, to degradation as well. So we're trying to tease out how much of it is direct photolysis versus indirect and then which of these processes are important for the different chemicals. So just a, a quick overview of some of the surface water here. So this is P8. So the organic matter level here is 25 milligrams of carbon per liter which is rather high. There's no nitrate, there's no nitrite, there's no iron. And the reason that's important is that these are also uh, things that can produce reactive oxygen species like hydroxyl radical. So the fact that there's none of them there means we're really just studying the photochemistry of the organic matter. So it's kind of a, a unique uh, environmental system in that respect. So the first thing we did was we probed the hydroxyl radical formation and we used this using uh, a compound called terephthalate, which the little bubble structure is shown here. Essentially, it reacts with the hydroxyl radical in one of the, the four positions, and then you get a fluorescent compound. And so you get something that's uh, very easy to detect at like nanomolar concentration, so very small. So we don't need to have very much reaction to occur and we can see it. And the parent compound is not fluorescent and the product is. And so we, we have a turn on probe that we're looking for the hydroxyl radical. And so we look at its accumulation over time. We know how fast the, the terephthalate reacts. We've done some studies to say what the yield of the reaction is. And so since we know the rate constant, we know the concentration of the, the terephthalate. Uh, if we look at the rate of growth, we can calculate the steady state concentration of the hydroxyl radical. We do something similar to look at the triplet organic matter. Uh, this was developed by uh, Bill Mitch's group at Yale. We use uh, sorbic acid. And when it reacts with the sensitizer, it gets excited. And then around these double bonds, it rotates. And it gets, uh, you get structural isomers. And so through various chunks here, we basically quantify how much isomerization occurs. And through doing that, we can get some idea of what the steady state concentration of the uh, triplet organic matter was. And it's not a perfect probe because not all molecules react with the same energies of excited states. But it gives us some idea of the steady state concentration of the, the triplet organic matter that's present. And we used a couple other probes. We used first year alcohol for single oxygen. We use a dimethylamine for a carbonate <coughs> radical. And we get, can measure these steady state concentrations. And they're small, right? So we're talking you know, 10 to the minus 17 molar for hydroxyl radical, or 10 to the minus 15 molar for this triple organic matter. But the rate constants with these things are fast. So even though these are at very low concentrations, the second order rate constants of, of pollutants with them are, are essentially diffusion controlled in some cases. So when you have 10 to the 9th times 10 to the minus 17, you get 10 to the minus 8, which actually gets you degradation over reasonable environmental time scales. And if we look at the difference between the triplet organic matter, it's two orders of magnitude higher, but has similar rate constants. And so this was kind of our first hint, the baby, this might be important, since no one had really measured these steady state concentrations before. So what Tung did is he started using, uh, the pest, putting the pesticides in the pore waters and Put in them, we have a photo simulator downstairs because as we saw winter ice you know, forms and you can't do photochemistry outside and it's cold. But we would always, we try and verify things by doing them out on the roof. Although I think we can't get out there anymore. We have to get, need to get a new key. Um, 
we analyze our uh, samples by liquid chromatography and we look at the concentration going away over time. So this was uh, an example of, of Tung's dogged perseverance. I, when I proposed this idea to him, I said, okay, do five, find five pesticides in, in some different classes. It'll be a nice little quick paper for the end of your thesis. And a few weeks later, he came back and he had, with the first rounds of data, he says, okay, I decided five was too few, I'm going to do 16. Right. And here's the, my first uh, step on the 16. I'm like, oh, okay, you know, go for it. And so we've got, all these are, are used in Minnesota, various structures, you know, these are the triazines, uh, diuron and uh, isoproteron, these are phenylureas. Uh, trifolin, you can buy, it's preen at Home Depot. Pen pendimethylin is in, if you put crabgrass preventer on your lawn. Uh, these ones got cut off here. These are like uh, metolachlor and alachlor. And so he started looking at the reaction. So he always does one in the dark. So here's atrazine in the dark, nothing happens. He does it in pure water and it goes away slowly. And then he does it in the, the surface water and it goes away much more quickly. So that tells us that these indirect processes are important, that the organic matter is creating reactive species that is making the pesticide go away faster than just sunlight alone. And for most of the species, we see that indirect photolysis. For a few, we don't. So like pendimethylene, uh, this is, is bright yellow. And so it's absorbing sunlight, obviously. And so it, the direct photolysis outweighs uh, any indirect photolysis. So we can kind of not worry about that one. So we want to now try to tease out what's causing this accelerated reaction. And so if we look at the overall rate constants, it's a function of the direct reaction plus the reaction with all these different reactive species. So it's a combination of the steady state concentration and its second order rate constant. And so what uh, we did is we started quenching out the different species. So we add isopropanol to the system and that turns off the hydroxyl radical because all the hydroxyl radical reacts with isopropanol instead of the pesticide. And so if we look at the difference between the reaction in the prairie pothole water and with the isopropanol and the difference tells us what the rate constant with hydroxyl radical is. We can do the same thing with uh, singled oxygen. We use histidine to turn that off. We can actually use the pro-absorbic acid to turn off the organic matter. The other thing we can do is we can either put oxygen in the system or take it out. And that gives us some indication of how important the triplets are versus the, the singled oxygen. Oxygen is a triplet quencher. So here when we put oxygen in, the reaction goes slower, which means the triplets are important. When we take the oxygen out, there's more st the steady state concentration of the triplet organic matter is higher, so the reaction is accelerated we'd see different behavior of singlet oxygen was, was important. So we can kind of tease out what these rate constants are. And then we can, you know, plot them on a bar chart and see what the total uh, degradation is. And, you know, there's some amount we can't account for. So here are those three that react by direct photolysis. They're all direct. But we see these kind of big teal, fish, blue, green bars, right? That showed that triple organic matter was important. For some of them, singlet oxygen was important. And this was really the first study that showed that this triple organic matter was important for a, a wide range of pesticides. We can also see little contributions from the carbonate radical and the hydroxyl radical and the like. The other thing is we've measured these steady state concentrations and then we've used the quenching experiments to measure these first order rate constants so we can calculate these second order rate constants. And some of them have been measured before. So for example, with, with um, hydroxyl radicals is relatively easy to measure in the lab. So you can just look in the literature and see what people had found before for various pesticides. Oh, sorry, that's what they measured. This is what we got from our quenching experiments. And so it's an indirect way of measuring these rate constants, but we get pretty close matches to what the literature values were. So we know that our, our method is solid. What that allows us to do, though, is also say, use that same little mathematical trick here to measure the rate constants with triplet organic matter, which is much harder to do in the lab because you can't get triplet organic matter. It's easy to make hydroxyl radical in the lab. It's hard to make triplet organic matter. So having another way to measure these rate constants is important. The only way to, to really kind of make this is with laser studies. And we don't have a nice laser table. So with this, we figured out that organic matter was a major pho photosensitizer in these systems. And was very important in the processing rate of the pesticides. And it was largely triplet organic matter and singlet oxygen. We did notice that when we did this outside versus inside, it, it was slower. But of course, inside we have a very bright lamp. We don't have to worry about clouds. And so we can kind of scale the rate constants to figure out what's going on in the environment. So about the time uh, Tung was wrapping up his experiments, 
I realized that we might be able to, to do some prediction of them. And so I started playing with, uh, well, I've been playing with this for a while with the computational chemistry methods on the uh, supercomputer to see if we could figure out ways to predict how fast these reactions were occurring. And this was inspired by uh, a visit from Thomas Hofstetter from uh, Switzerland. He came here in 2011, 2012, I can't remember, and spent a couple months working with uh, me and uh, now Associate Dean Kramer to try and develop some, use some computational tools to explain his, his findings. And of course, to do this, I used all of Tung's data, so I have to, to thank him again. And the Supercomputing Institute provided the, the time to do this. So the general idea here was that if we have uh, a rate constant, it's potentially related to the thermodynamics of the reaction. So how much energy does it take to take the pesticide and rip one of the electrons off of it? And the nice thing is you can calculate this uh, computationally. And so you need a data source for this. And so we had tongues data, but I wanted more data points than that. And so I started mining the literature for either pesticides or other structure related compounds where people had measured the rate constants of them with different radicals. And so I focused on the carbonate radical and the, the triplet organic matter. And so a lot of the data came from uh, largely these two sources and these other ones were minor, uh, one, you know, one or two compounds a piece, but these were dozens of compounds. So to do this, we use a, a program package called Gaussian. Uh, it allows us to do all sorts of different levels of theory. Uh, I stick with density functional theory. Uh, this is the Minnesota 06 functional. You might as well keep it in house. This is uh, John Trular's work that they developed these functionals. This just tells us how we're accounting for the electrons and how many basis, it's the basis set. So what we do is we optimize the geometry of the molecule with this and it wiggles it around and finds a, an energy minimum. And then there's a frequency calculation that verifies that you're at a, a, an actual minimum rather than at a saddle point, which is a transition state. And then we do a, a higher level of theory to get a, a better energy on it. And then we use something called the, the Solvation Minnesota Dunn model because <laughs> they had Solvation Model 5 and Solvation Model 6 and when they were done, they labeled it, they had 5.4.2 and 5, <laughs> and then SMD is done. <laughs> and then basically you, you get this gigabyte of, of data out and you take one number out of the file, which is essential. you're looking for the ionization potential. You're looking at the difference in the energies between the two molecules, one we've, the parent molecule and one we've re removed an electron. And you have to do some corrections and you scale it so it's at the, uh, compared to the normal hydrogen electrode. And so I tested this out with a series of compounds where there were known measured uh, reduction or oxidation potentials. So I have a calculated value on this axis, an experimental value on this axis. The, the mean on-site error is about 0.14 volts, but you notice this is not on a one-to-one -one line. The slope is actually 1.68. If you, uh, I'll call it cheating, if you use this rege regression and take the, run the calculated model through, the, you take the calculated number and convert it into an experimental, uh, a pseudo-experimental number, then they all kind of fall in this nice one-to-one -one line. And so we have a method where relative to one another, the numbers are probably good, but in an absolute sense, they're not correct. And so then the decision I had to make is I have this suite of about 70 compounds, so I run this correction for all of them. And I decided the answer was no, largely because they don't all have this structure. Some of them have different, they're different shapes, they're multiple nitrogen groups. And so we decided the, the safest thing to do is because relative to one another, we might get some predictive power. There's no reason to run them through this correction. But this shows that we, we could do this if we, if we wanted to, or if we had more of molecules of this particular structure. So these are the different classes of, of molecules. We have various anilines, uh, the triazine herbicides, various urea herbicides, a bunch of amides, including things like acetochlor, uh, various amines, the neonicotinoids, which are uh, a lot of attention now, these are the things that are thought to be killing off the bees. Uh, you know, just in indoles and amines, these are synthetic intermediates, things that might have gotten in the environment. We have structures that we can't figure out exactly what category they fall in. Uh, the difference winds up being whether or not the nitrogen has some relation to an aromatic structure, right? So if we pull an electron here, we can disperse the electron into the ring. S same for an electron here. These have no kind of resonance stabilization on them. So I wind up having to separate the compounds based on their, their structure that way. So these are all the, the compounds that have um, some kind of resonance stabilization of the, the, the uh, radical once we form it. 
So we take the log of the rate constant versus the, the oxidation potential. And so what I did is take, uh, this is all the data. And then what I would do is take uh, a random set of 20 points or 20 percent of the points and see how that, well they were predicted by the other 80 percent and do that for every possible combination. I have to thank Julian for sending me the spreadsheet that actually allowed me to randomize the, the samples like that. And so when you do that for the every training set, you have the training set for the test set, you're off by uh, essentially 0.5 log units. And only four of the, the suite of compounds were off by more than a factor of 10. And so you're going to get at least you know, an order of magnitude estimate of your rate constant without ever having to do an experiment. For the uh, ones without resonance stabilization, there's many fewer points. So of course, the confidence intervals are much bigger. And again, you have a, it's only, I think, 16 uh, points. And so you get actually not that big of an error, but there's definitely some more uncertainty there because it, it's fewer points. And when I did this, uh, when I published this paper, one of the comments was like, well, why didn't you do more chemicals? And why didn't you also consider phenols? And the short answer at that time was, this is for a special issue. This is what I can do with the amount of time before the special issue uh, deadline is. And I've had an undergrad now since go on and calculated uh, you know, several dozen phenol molecules. And so now we're continuing down that pathway. And so what we're limited by here is uh, data sources, particularly with, with uh, oops, sorry. For the triple organic matter, we can use the same correlation. But here we have very limited amount of data, right? So uh, Silvio Canonica in Switzerland has measured a, a few of these with model sensitizers. There are a few studies where they've been measured with laser flash photolysis. We don't have a whole lot of data we can use. And then we have the, the little bit that, that Tung collected uh, using his quenching method. And so when we plot those, the log of the rate constant versus the uh, oxidation potential, it turns out it depends on what our triplet sensitizer is. So this is Tung's data here. Uh, this is data with using benzophenone as a sensitizer, and this is using something called 3 methyl methoxy acetophenone as a sensitizer. So it turns out the energy of your sensitizer matters. And so what we're trying to play with now is figure out, is there a model sensitizer that's a good representative for organic matter? And do different organic matters from different places uh, react differently? So this is what Andy is working on now. Uh, one other thing to note here is this starts to look, you might see a little bit of bending here. And so this could be, we're approaching diffusion control limits here. And so whether we should include these points or not is questionable. The other issue with this is we don't exactly know what this process is. It could be electron abstraction. It could be hydrogen abstraction. It could be energy transfer. In terms of oxidation, they all might look approximately the same. If you pull off a hydrogen, you're pulling off a hydrogen and an electron. And so energetically, it's not that different. So we can't necessarily infer that because this correlation is true that this is an electron transfer reaction. It's just that a parameter we've chosen predicts potentially multiple processes. OK. So we can calculate reasonable oxidation potentials for a, a bunch of different chemicals. We can correlate them with carbonate radical and uh, triple organic matter. And the question I often get at this point is, well, why didn't you do hydroxyl radical? Because there's all sorts of data out there. Well, it turns out that that's a, a different process. It's pulling off a hydrogen. And there's so many different spots that can pull off a hydrogen, it's, it's computationally intractable. Or not intractable, you could do it. It would take a very long time to test all the different hydrogens on the molecule to see which one is going to come off. And so now we're trying this with other reactive species and other compound classes. So all of this got us interested in saying, OK, this organic matter is very reactive. Uh, we might be able to predict its reactivity. Maybe we ought to explore its structure a little bit. And because we have the sulfur in the system, potentially it, it reacts with the organic matter. It might give us some unique uh, characteristics. And so we did two things. One was uh, uh, we worked with uh, Pat Hatcher in at Old Dominion to do some mass spectrometry, and then Brady did Honer on the St. Paul campus to do some uh, X-ray absorption work. So I said before that the sulfate goes down in the sediments is reduced by bacteria. This is the, the standard bacteria picture. Uh, you get this reduced sulfur species, and it turns out they bind with the organic matter. And the organic matter in these systems is not static. It's not staying in the sediment or staying in the water. It cycles between the two. And so as the organic matter gets uh, pushed out into the water, it might get oxidized. And you'll have different sulfur functionality in the organic matter and potentially different reactivity. And so we wanted to look at the organic matter in different compartments and across the hydrologic gradient to see how it, it changed in space.
so we have these four wetlands we've been studying. We want to know, does the organic matter look the same in all of them? And they're only a few hundred meters apart, right? So you can walk from one to the other. Get some insight into how the sulfur is incorporated. Is it, do you need biology for it to get incorporated? Is it chemical reactions incorporating it? And are there differences between what's in the surface water and what's in the, in the pore waters? And so we used NMR. This is Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry. I'll show you one in a moment. X-ray absorption near edge spectrometry. And so we take these samples, we concentrate the organic matter down on a, on a solid phase extraction cartridge and elute it off. So now we have a very concentrated sample in methanol we can look at for the mass spectrometry. Or we take the sediments and you can actually put them in the, in the beam line to, to do the zanes. So this is the NMR of the different surface waters and one of the pore waters. And I'm going to show this and not interpret it at all except that all the squiggles look about the same. And so that we don't get a whole lot of information about the, the NMR in terms of the different types of, in the structures. What we do get is information from the mass spectrometry. So this is uh, the instrument here. Um, well, trying to, they don't have a good scale in here. It's probably, this is probably about six or eight feet tall. There's a, I think a 12 Tesla magnet inside there. Which, so what this allows you to do is get the molecular formula of each individual ion that goes to the system. So you inject your sample, there's no chromatography on the front end, and you get every molecule that's injected, you get a molecular, exact molecular formula on it, because it gives you the molecular weight out to like six digits, right, beyond the decimal point. So we think of carbon as, well, carbon is 12.000 whatever, but hydrogen is 1.019 something, and carbon 13 is 13 point something, and because you have so much accuracy, you get exact molecular formulas, and you get thousands of them, you know, so 5,430 molecular formulas in that sample. And you don't know whether every formula you get is a single compound, it most certainly isn't. It's probably dozens of different molecules because with dozens of different structures, but you get it that it's C12H27O8N2S or something like that. What was interesting about this is, you know, we're getting about, we have the four surface waters and the four pore waters, and when uh, the group at Old Dominion sent us the data back. They said, we've never seen anything like this before. And we said, why not? So, said, well, you've got ridiculous amounts of nitrogen and sulfur. So usually, you know, this is, this is numbers and this is uh, magnitude of the signal. They said, usually in terms of numbers, almost 75 or 80 percent of the molecules have only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in them. And you guys only have, you know, 30 or 40 percent. You've got huge amounts of nitrogen and, and huge amounts of sulfur. They said, you know, uh, sulfur is usually only one or two percent of the molecules have sulfur in them. And we've got that much that have nitrogen and sulfur in them. And so this is a, a, a huge data set and it's very hard to look at. And so you have to plot it a, a different way, in a Van Crevelin diagram. And I stole this from, you know, the Brazonic and Arnold book. I think Pat drew this, or he stole it from somewhere else maybe. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So what you do is you plot for every molecule the hydrogen carbon ratio on one axis and the oxygen carbon ratio on the other axis. And so this gives you an idea of kind of the, the oxidation state of the molecule. So things that have more oxygen in them are more oxidized. So things like carbohydrates and sugars have a lot of oxygen. They appear here on the diagram. Uh, proteins will appear here. Lignin here, black carbon is very reduced. Right? So it's largely carbon and hydrogen, very little oxygen. You can think of this as soot. It's down in this corner. And these aren't hard and fast rules but it gives you a general idea of, of where things are. So what are our Van Crevelin diagrams look like? Well, here's our, our carbon, hydrogen, oxygen formulas. Here's our ones with nitrogen, nitrogen, or sorry, with sulfur, and with nitrogen and sulfur. And they're all kind of clustered around this center portion of the diagram. The, the oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur ones are shifted a little bit to the right. But this is nice because now you can view thousands of data points and potentially look for, for patterns. And the, the pattern here is that it doesn't matter whether it's got just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, or you start incorporating the nitrogen and the sulfur. They all overlap on one another. And my first question was, well, so what? Well, that, that turns out that if you have biological incorporation of the nitrogen or the oxygen, you should see shifts, right? Because biological things should be oxidizing and reducing the molecules as, as they do that. And so if they were making protein, you would expect that the, you know, shift towards this direction. Or if they were, you know, oxidizing it in some way, they would shift this direction. And so, 
what they tell me anyway, is that this suggests that both the nitrogen and the sulfur are being incorporated into the organic matter by an abiotic process. So for sulfur, this makes sense. Uh, hydrogen sulfide is a good nucleophile. It reacts with organic molecules, for those of you who remember back to your organic chemistry. Uh, you know, it will insert itself. And since we have high levels of hydrogen sulfide in the systems, like mil uh, millimolar levels, which is insanely high, and there's groups in the organic matter that should react with it, that makes sense. The nitrogen we have a little harder time explaining. Because there's definitely ammonia in there, but we're wondering, is there something kind of molecule being created either biologically or abiotically that's got a potent enough nitrogen nucleophile that's reacting with the organic matter? And so we're still interested in trying to figure that out. We can uh, look at this using a non-metric multidimensional scaling, see where the different formulas fall and where the different uh, poor waters fall. So we, we see that, you know, the poor waters have a lot of sulfur in them or down here. Uh, the, the T9, there's very little sulfur in this wetland. It, it clusters separately. And so you get different patterns. The surface waters are all over here. And we can kind of see across that recharge gradient, which is T9, going to P7, going to P1 and P8, we see a, that's the, the gradient. And obviously the pore waters and the surface waters are very different from one another, which is kind of interesting. So then uh, I thought, I actually was at a, a conference and I ran into Brandy Toner and she was presenting a poster. And she said, oh yeah, we're looking at sulfur and sediments. And I said, great, I've got some samples. You want to run them? And she says, well, my students are busy, but I have lots of beam time. Would your student want to come out to Berkeley and go out to the nuclear reactor and you know, run samples? So I came back to Tong and I said, do you want to go spend a couple of weeks out in California sitting, doing 24 hour shifts at the beam line? He said, sure. <laughs> right. And I said, you know, the worst case, scenario here is that you go get experience with a technique that not many people have used, right? So to look good on your resume. The best case scenario is you get another paper, right? And luckily for Tanya, it was the best case scenario. We wound up getting a, a nice little paper out of this. So sulfur is a great element because it, it, you can have an oxidation state anywhere from minus two, where it's you know, completely reduced, up to plus six, where it's sulfate, and anywhere in between. And there's all sorts of different organic and inorganic structures it can be in. And so if you have a system where sulfur is cycling, you have the opportunity to, to see lots of different stuff. And so this is X-ray absorption near edge structure spectroscopy. If you want a really good tutorial on it, you go talk to Brandy. Um, essentially what you do is you shoot in X-rays and then you know, measure the energy of the electrons that come off. And that gives you some idea of the elements that are present and what, the, what their binding environment is. And so there's a range here, so you get uh, 2469 electron volts for the most reduced sulfur species and 2483 electron volts for the most oxidized. And so but looking at that difference, you can figure it out. But you need standards. And well, what this looks like is you get this uh, you know, white line peak, and then you're looking for this bump here. So you've got to look at all the, interpret all the wiggly lines. And so this is a, a sediment from P1 from four different seasons smeared on some uh, plastic essentially and you then look at the different spots and see where the different energies light up so you know it, the little red dots are at 2482, 2473 and you compare those to standards and so we have inorganic sulfate all the way down to mckinnonite which is an iron mineral and this, this squiggle shifts a little bit and so based on where your squiggle is you can do a linear combination of these squiggles to kind of match up and quantify how much sulfur you have there. And so when we do this over the different seasons, you can kind of cluster it into the different categories. You either have kind of pyrite sulfur, some organic sulfur, or oxidized sulfur. And in the winter, you see a lot more reduced sulfur. And in the summer, you see a lot more oxidized sulfur. And this makes some sense. You know, there's cattails growing in these wetlands. There's oxygen being pumped down in the sediments. And so we can see a, a dynamic in the amount of organic and inorganic, or sorry, oxidized and, oxidized and reduced sulfur we have. You can't figure out when the sulfur is oxidized whether it's sulfate or it's still bound into the organic, but you can get an idea of the redox cycling. And so right now we're in the process of our next try to NSF, 
between uh, Brandy and myself and the collaborators at Ohio State to, to look at this system to try and look at the cycling of the electrons through the organic matter and the sulfur and what role the, the chemistry and the biology uh, play in that over time. So what we found really interesting here is we get dramatically different differences in the organic matter structure over short distances. So you know you can walk from T9 to P1 and the organic matter at one is completely different than the other in terms of its oxidation. And we expect that the uh, same will be true for the sediments because the underlying geology is different at the different points. And so all this means that how the pesticide is processed in one wetland that's 100 meters from another wetland is going to be very different. So the ones that have a lot of sulfur may have a lot of turnover of the pesticides and a lot of uh, organic matter, you may get a lot of photolysis of them. The ones that are up gradient, there's not a lot of organic matter, there's not a lot of sulfur, you may have much more persistence in the pesticides there. And unfortunately at this site, the two wetlands that have lots of sulfur and would process the pesticides are not the ones that are next to the farm fields. Right, so the one with kind of low sulfur and medium organic matter, you can see the cornfield draining into it. And then the other one that's got the cows pooping in it that has, uh, that has no sulfur whatsoever. Cows don't put in pesticides, but they put other chemicals into the water. And so the incorporation of nitrogen and sulfur in the system is abiotic, which is unusual. And then we need to understand the, the redox cycling of the sulfur better. So what we're trying to, to still keep going here is um, assess the reducing capacity of the organic matter. So uh, Grant Wallace, who's my student now, has been working trying to figure out uh, what the potential of the organic matter is itself to transfer electrons versus the sulfur in the, the system. And so do you just need reduced organic matter? Do you need sulfur and reduced organic matter to destroy pesticides? Uh, we can look at the reaction products and figure out what their fate is and how toxic they are. Um, Andy's looking at f organic matter in different settings, trying to figure out how its structure and its source affects its photoreactivity. And we'd like to do more exploration of the, the sulfur speciation in the system. We've done some of that already. Uh, my collaborator, Yo Chin, has used electrodes to try and look at different uh, places in, this, in the sediments spatially to see how the, the sulfur varies. So I have to thank again uh, Tung, who did, well, it's 80% of the work that was shown here. Uh, my collaborators, Kristen Thomas and, and Yo. Andy and Grant and various other people who have helped us along the way, and especially the Dave Mache up at the Northern Prairie Wildlife Research Center in North Dakota. Whenever we call him and say, hey, we want to come up, can you put out a boat and oars and life jackets for us, is more than happy to, to drag it out there for us. And then uh, the toner group as well for all the allowing us to piggyback on their beam time. And with that, I can answer any chemical or otherwise questions that you guys might have. And Andy, I can send you those pictures too. <laughs> and I have to bring you the microphone if you have a question or comment for our audience. Um, Bill, um, what was the dissolved oxygen in, in these uh, waters? Is it high? Is it low? What kind of numbers are we looking at? Well, they're only about a meter deep. And so, it depends, one to two meters deep. And so the water column itself, it's pretty high. What do we see? It's usually close to saturation, isn't it? Yeah. And then as soon as you get into the sediment, mm -hmm. it, it's absolutely zero. So do you get denitrification as a result of sulfur? Uh, do you sulfur in the pyrite basically reducing the nitrate? Well, it depends. So the only one of these four wetlands that probably has a nitrate input is P7, because mm -hmm. it's got the cornfield on it. And we see a little bit of nitrate in the, the water column, but not much. And so my guess is in the sediment, there's a lot of denitrification that's occurring. Uh, in the water column, probably not, though, because it's, it's oxic. Okay. And yeah. lastly, with respect to pesticide degradation and so forth, is the goal of your research at the end of the day, when you understand everything, <laughs> <laughs> is the goal of it to try and uh, determine how you might accelerate that pesticide uh, breakdown? Yeah, so I mean, some of it is if you're have an option, right, and you're trying to direct the, your farm field runoff from, to one wetland or another, you, know, you probably ought to go to the one that's more reducing and can process the, the pesticides. Um, the other thing to do just in general is if you can show that this is a, a place, that these wetlands are a sink for the pesticides, 
then you have a motivation to go to the, the Ducks Unlimited actually wants to go to the farmers and say, hey, don't plow under your wetlands, don't fill them in. They're actually getting rid of the pesticides that are flowing off your land and then the ducks can breed there as well. Of course, if the pesticide levels are too high, then you get deformed ducks and that's yeah. a problem as, as well, so. Paige has one up there. Um, just more of a comment, I wonder if you've got um, some Animox processes going on and that might generate reactive nitrogen species that then could get incorporated into the, um, into the organic matter. Yeah, I mean we think, so um, it's Mike Wilkins at Ohio State who's uh, starting to look, I forgot we did Illumina, okay. metagenomics, I, I can't okay. remember what he, but he's taken samples. So gone then out he of should be able to see that if that's if those organisms are there anyway. Yeah, he so wouldn't. I mean, he's looking for the sulfur cyclers, then he wants okay. to look at the nitrogen cyclers okay. as well. Yeah, because for the nitrogen to be incorporated, I mean, if the nitrate is reduced and you get ammonia, um, um, ammonia is a regional nucleophile, but the pHs aren't high enough. Yeah. And so it's got to be something else that's more potent, something on an or it's got to be on a like an aniline or something like that that's on a, a, a carbon on an organic group that yeah. is a potent enough nucleophile. It'll be interesting. You'll yeah. have to let me know what you find okay. out. <laughs> okay, if there... Last three years have been wet in that area that you are looking at, wetter yeah. than usual. Is that gonna have an impact? And, and for example, was the temporary and permanent just during your three years, or was that an assessment that they did over the last 20 by the USGS? That's an assessment over the past 20 by the USGS, and so actually, uh, well, I, this, this, is, this is P1 here, and this part right here used to be called T1, but it's, it actually still is called T1, but it's permanent now. It, the hydrology changed, and they don't know why. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, and it's, it, it definitely changes things, because it depends on how much recharge you get, how much water flows, it's gonna affect the geochemistry. So by doing it over multiple years, we got some idea of, of the, the changes, and so Andy's got data over a couple of seasons now looking at the photochemistry in, in the waters. And then, you know, T9 definitely disappears every year, late summer, even in wet years. But yeah, and so we, the project that we have going on now is collaboration with uh, a couple of different hydrologists, and so we're trying to link the hydrology and the chemistry all together. Okay, if there are no further questions, thanks again, Bill. Thank you. Please join us for wine and cheese in the rotunda. Everyone gets a chemistry dose for the year.